We're going to kind of take a break from our Dig Deeper series. We're going to start up again in a couple of weeks. We're going to be in Philemon tonight. So if you need a Bible, like Lloydie said, raise your hand. If not, in your phone or iPad or your Bible, open up to Philemon, the letter of Paul to Philemon. If you miss it, it's because it's one page long. So if you're like, I cannot find this anywhere, it's somewhere in the New Testament. And it's right before Hebrews. So if you find Hebrews, just take a left. Philemon. Lord, thank you so much for your word tonight, God. We thank you, Lord, for this time of worship, God. And and, uh, Lord, we're just grateful to be in your presence tonight. Grateful, God, to be able to glean from your word tonight. We pray that you'd speak to our hearts, Lord. I pray, God, that you would um, convict our hearts tonight, God. This is a, even though it's so uh, short of a, of a book tonight, Lord, this letter is a short letter, uh, but, Lord, it packs a punch, and there is a lot to glean from this. And so I pray, Lord, in these next couple of weeks as we study this, God, that you would Um, convict our hearts, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts for the work that you're going to do in us, Lord. And we, um, God, we, as we sang this evening, Lord, we want to make room for these things, God, as we look at forgiveness and reconciliation, Lord, these are hard things to do. And, uh, but God, we ask that you would have the space in our hearts and in our minds, Lord, that you would have the room in our relationships, God, um, that you would restore, reconcile, Lord, and, and teach us, God, about your forgiveness, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Is it all right if I read this letter to you guys? This is a, a very short letter. It's 25 verses, but I just wanted to kind of, uh, we, the next couple of weeks we're going to be studying through um, Philemon in this amazing letter, and uh, we're going to kind of do a part one this week and part two next week, and today we're really going to focus on forgiveness, and uh, next week we're going to focus on reconciliation, and so um, tonight uh, I just wanted to give us a, um, a foundation for what these, these two parts are going to be in as we read this whole uh, a letter in its entirety. So from verse one, it says, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I've derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, and now he is indeed useful to uh, to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted for, from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your, owing, um, of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. 
Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, as do Mar- and so do Mark, um, Aristic, Arist- Aristar- oh my gosh. That guy, Demas and Luke, my fellow workers, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirits. Amen? Such a small uh, letter, but man, does it pack a punch. There is an insane story in here, and this is really the only personal letter that we get from Paul. Think about, I mean, there's not a whole lot of, of modes of, of communication here in the ancient Near Eastern time. And so there, think about all of the countless letters Paul probably wrote to so many different people personally, um, and yet we get one of them. We get one of his letters that has not only been preserved, but it is added into the canon of scripture. Man, this is, uh, and it's such a short one. It's a short, uh, one of the shortest ones in the New Testament, but um, his shortest one for, for us to read. And, um, you know, the, um, you might be thinking, well, there's also uh, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. What about Titus? Those ones were to a specific person, but it was for the church at large. They were to leaders of a church, and so he was giving them to the elders of the church and to the other leaders of the church. And so it was for kind of a greater purpose at large. But this one specifically is for his friend Philemon. For someone that he also ministered the gospel to, someone who also came to know the Lord through Paul and uh, who was probably a member of either Timothy's church or something like that, but he um, was a, 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 a man of God. And out of all the personal letters, we get this one. It's imp- the importance is significant. It's unconventional forgiveness despite systemic freedom and judicial right to do whatever he wanted with his slave. Just to give you kind of a background of, of this time, there, there were definitely, um, in this time, it was a different time period of, of, of living and the system and the, ju- the uh, justice system was different. And so there, there was a, a um, there was a occupation of being a slave. There was also the occupation of being a bond servant, which was different than just being a slave. And so sometimes you could be born into slavery. Sometimes that could be an occupation that you choose and you could be a slave. Slave is, is, is a very bad word in our, in our modern vernacular. And so, um, uh, but in that time, it was somewhat of an occupation that wasn't necessarily just being sold into slavery, though there were many people who were also sold into slavery, but this was something of, of kind of service unto a family or unto a people group. And uh, so there was a slave, and the difference between a slave and a bond servant is that a slave was required to serve for seven years. This is found in the book, book of Numbers. A slave was required to serve for seven years, and after seven years, he was free to choose a different occupation to go and live a life of freedom, or the Bible says if he loved his master, he could choose to serve under the same master for the rest of his or her life. And then he would, if he chose to do that, he would be choosing the life of a bond servant, be choosing the life of a servant who is willing to to serve the rest of his life under the master whom he loved. And that significance, the significance of that was, or the signet of that, what what would, would signify to the rest of the community that this person was a bondservant is that the master would take his bondservant, would go to the doorpost of his home, and he would nail a, a, a big old awl in his, in his ears, just like a big pick, basically, like a, uh, a wood pick, uh, right into the, the, the ear. So this was like the first gauge of, uh, these guys were like pretty hardcore people and had some gauges going on here, but they would, they would nail a hole into the bond servant's ear, signifying the blood being signified on the post of the, of the door, or excuse me, the doorpost of the home of his master. And so it would signify his blood being stained on the doorpost that for his life, it now belongs to this family. Family. He's willing, willingly serving this family for the rest of his life, and he had an identity, this hole in his ear, as an identifiable trait for the rest of his life that I serve this family. It's interesting, later on, it's interesting that 
uh, uh, in Philippians, if you turn back to the, to the letter uh, to Philippians, to the church in Philippi, in the book of Philippians, it, this, this is what is talked about of Jesus Christ himself. In Philippians chapter two, it talks about Jesus Christ. He came as a form of a bondservant for you and for me. What a beautiful picture that Jesus chose to serve you and to serve me. And he willingly gave his life. It wasn't something that he had to do. It was something he chose to do to serve you and to serve me. And Philippians chapter 2 talks about him coming as a bond servant. And man, it's not just a, a hole in his ear, but he has holes in his wrist that signify this. He has a hole in his side that signifies this. He has holes in his feet that signify this. And his blood is sprinkled on the doorpost, just like Passover. Remember Passover in the Old Testament? Just like Passover, his blood is sprinkled on the doorpost of your own heart. When you choose to believe in him as he has chosen to serve you, when you choose to accept him in your heart, his blood is stained on the doorpost of your heart, meaning that you belong to him forever. You belong to him for the rest of your life. You belong to Jesus forever and ever. And so this is what Paul is talking about here. He's he's talking about a specific servant, a, a specific slave named Onesimus. And here as we're gathering from different parts, this is the only really time that it talks about Philemon in the the New Testament. So this is kind of, we don't know a whole lot about this guy other than verses four through seven of his character. We know that Onesimus was his slave and was someone that he served for a long period of time. And we know that something happened. There was some kind of tension in this relationship. And many scholars, what they believe is that Onesimus at some point in his life, um, at some point in his career with Philemon, he he, he stole from his master. He stole something from him and he ran off and ran away. And under the judicial law of this time, this was a really high crime. This was something really, really significant for somebody to do. It's something really um, shameful to do for, for somebody to, to, to steal something away. And so Philemon had every right to find, to pursue after this person, to pursue after him, and really had every right to either force him back into slavery, force him back into serving him and doing things for him violently, even making him do certain things and, 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 and forcing him by violence to, to obey what he was wanting him to do, or he could even feed him to, uh, to some you know, animals. He could kill him in a brutal way. He had a ton of rights to do whatever he wanted to this slave, to Onesimus. And Paul here, this letter is saying, hey, I met your servant We were talking the other day, God was moving in his life and God saved him. This man is a changed man. Onesimus is a different person. He has surrendered his life to Jesus. And I can attest this. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. He's in prison at this time. So this is a prison letter. He's writing in the midst of of being bound in chains and he's writing in prison. He's saying, I am writing this to you. I'm telling you, I've seen the life change in this man. I've seen the transformation in this man. And I'm asking you, can you forgive him? Can you forgive him of everything? Can you forgive him of all of his debts? Can you forgive him of everything he owes you? I will pay it back from my own pocket. I will pay back everything he owes you. And not only can he come back, I would love to keep him, but this is what Paul is saying. I'd love to keep him, but I would rather give him back to you so that you can take him into your care and into your, love, your, your house, into your home, into your loving care. And I would love to, for him not only to serve you once again, but he wants to be your bond servant. He wants to serve you, but even more than that, he's not just a bond servant anymore, he's your brother. He's a brother in Christ, so would you forgive him? Man, this broke pretty much every kind of rule in that time. The answer for so many people in this time would have been, no, this guy owes me everything. He owes me his life. He stole from me. He did all of these evil things to my family. No, I'm not going to forgive him. I'm not going to, to restore him back into my home. I'm not going to give him something he doesn't deserve. But Paul is calling Philemon to do something that was countercultural. He's calling him to do something that was against the justice system. 
against the cultural system, against the normal, the normal sea of life, he says, I need you to do something for me because of your love for me and because of your love for God. Would you forgive this man? Forgive him of everything. Man, forgiveness is one of the hardest things to do as believers, isn't it? It's one of the hardest things to do as believers. But honestly, forgiveness was one of the hardest things to receive as believers. How many of you can attest to that, that it was hard to receive God's forgiveness? I mean, for me, it was hard to receive his forgiveness knowing the, the crap that was in my life, excuse my language, but knowing the, the depths of my sin and knowing where I've been or what I could have been, where I could have been and knowing who I was and knowing just the depths of my heart and to think, God, you could forgive me? How could you forgive that? How in the world could you forgive me of all of these things? Things I don't even know I'm going to do in the future. You forgave me my past, my present, my future, and not only me, but you, you forgave that guy over there. I know what that guy has done too. You've forgiven him, you've forgiven her. Man, how could you? It must have been something that we've done. It's not, it's not even about what I've done. It's not even about what I brought to you. It's not even about what I could offer. You've forgiven, you have forgiven me because of really no reason other than your great love for me. How? How is that possible? Man, it was, it was hard. I, f- I feel like at some point it is so hard. I remember talking to a friend of mine for a long time that was struggling with this. And e- almost every week when we would, we would talk on the phone, this was like the struggle he was, he was going through. He's like, man, I don't think God has really forgiven me. I don't know if God has actually forgiven me. What if I get to heaven? And he's like, nope, you actually did worse than everybody else. And so I couldn't, my forgiveness couldn't, you know, stretch further for you. Sorry. Like everybody else wasn't as bad as you. You were pretty bad. So my, my forgiveness only can go so far. No, it was like, man, I was, I had to encourage this brother. You have to remember that where your sin abounds, grace abounds even more. There is not a thing you could do that is too hard for God to forgive. There's not a place that you can go that is too far for God to reach. God is able to forgive us of anything. Man, it was hard to receive that, but how many, feel, how many of you have felt the most amazing freedom because of his forgiveness? Man, the weight that was lifted when you finally accepted it and say, God, I don't know how, but I'm going to let you forgive me. I don't know how you can do it, but I, I want you to forgive me. And the weight that was lifted, the chains that were broken, the clarity in your mind, the clean clean heart that you received and just the new life that you now are able to live, not not just in the future and after this life when we live in glory, but the, the new life God gives you now, the freedom that there is in the forgiveness of God. And this is what Paul is asking for, for Onesimus with Philemon, he says, I want him to have a full restoration. The forgiveness that you received from Jesus, I want you to give the same to this man. And that is one of the hardest things is not only to receive God's forgiveness, but now to turn it around and to forgive everybody else. Man, as a Christian, It is so freeing to receive his forgiveness, to know that he's forgiven us, to know about his love for us and his grace and his mercy. But then when we find out that we are called to do the same, that's a little bit more difficult, isn't it? (laughs) It's like, but you don't know what he's done. Like, you don't know what she's done. You don't know the things that, that they did to me. You don't know the things that that person has done to me. How am I supposed to forgive somebody else? We're expected to do the same. Maybe you have felt in in your life when you have gotten to that place where someone has hurt you, someone has caused you deep pain in your life, And maybe that's even been a struggle where you felt like this anger, you felt this bitterness, you have felt like something stirring up in your heart, this grief in your heart, and you think, Am I, as a Christian, am I supposed to feel this? 
Am I supposed to feel this to somebody? Man, I feel this pain. I feel this hurt. How do I, how do I get rid of this? Is this something a Christian should feel? But I want to encourage you, every Christian deals with deep hurt, even from the people they love the most. Every single one of us in, in our life, even as we have accepted Jesus in our hearts, even as we're living our new life with God, something is going to happen in your life. Things and circumstances are going to happen in your life. And every Christian person, no matter how strong you are in the Lord, no matter how mature you are in the Lord, you're still going to feel that pain. You're still going to feel that hurt. Look at the, the character of Philemon here. We don't know a lot about him, but let me read verse 4 to you. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. This is Paul speaking to Philemon. Because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. This is not just like a new believer. This is not somebody that is just like, you know, uh, just a, 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 you know, somebody that has not been walking with the Lord long. This is somebody who is mature in his faith. This is somebody who is mature in his faith, who has been walking with the Lord, who has ministry, who God has done ministry in and through his life to where many people have been refreshed and restored because of the work that God has done through this man's life. And Paul is speaking to him knowing that he is going to struggle with this. Paul knows this is going to be a hard thing for Philemon to do. And so this is the encouraging letter that he writes to uh, Philemon. Every Christian is going to wrestle with forgiveness, not just not just the, to receive the forgiveness of God, but to give forgiveness to the people around us. No matter how long you've been, work, been walking with the Lord, every Christian is going to wrestle with this. Many of you in here have real pain. So when I'm talking about uh, forgiveness and when I'm talking about extending forgiveness, I don't want to minimize the pain that you have really actually felt in your life. The extension of forgiveness that God is calling every Christian to do is not to minimize the pain that you've gone through in your life, the trauma that you have been through in your life. Some of us in here have suffered real tragedy. Some of us have suffered real severe trials. Some of us have been victims of real trauma and real pain. And the call to forgiveness from God is not to minimize that thing. A lot of times, uh, even for Christians and for um, pastors and things like that, it can feel like when we're talking about to forgiveness, like your pain doesn't matter. It can feel like you're, you're not supposed to feel these things. We just have to forgive everybody. We just have to forgive those who have wronged us or those who have sinned against us. You just, that's just the call of a Christian. And it can almost feel like, man, does God see my pain? Does God see what has happened to me? Does God see how this person has wronged me? And so it, it can feel like the pain doesn't, doesn't it matter or shouldn't exist. But I want, to, in, I want to tell you that God sees your pain. That God sees the trauma that you've gone through. That God sees the real pain that has happened in your life. He, see, he sees the wrongdoing. He sees the sin just as much as he saw what happened to him as he walked to the cross. Just as he saw the pain on his own body that he suffered for us, just as he saw those things that was done for us, just as he hung on the cross and saw us in our sins, just as he saw how we would turn our backs on him, just as he saw all of these things, all of the darkness around us, he still hung on the cross. And there was a moment where he said, Father, what does he say? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. There was still an extension of forgiveness that Jesus showed even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of trauma, even in the midst of tragedy. There was a moment that Jesus still forgave. And this is the call that God has in each and every one of our lives that even in the midst of pain, it doesn't minimize it. It doesn't, it doesn't devalue it. It doesn't push it away like it doesn't exist. God sees you in your pain. 
and he knows the pain that you're going through because he suffered pain himself, real pain, and was still led to forgive, to forgive those around him. But just because you're a Christian as well, a lot of times for, um, in church and a lot of times the story goes that in your new life, that all the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So sometimes the thought is, as a Christian, just because you are a Christian doesn't mean all of those things automatically go away. Even though there is new life in Christ, that is a reality, that is a truth, but it does not just mean that all of those things, the, the trauma that we experience in our life, the pain in our life, it doesn't just automatically just go away. There is a process that God is doing in our life to heal us, to sanctify us, to refine us, to to make us more like him as we begin this new life with him. So that doesn't mean that the trauma and the other things that you've dealt with before you became a Christian just disappears. And so left to themselves, left to themselves this unforgiveness or these, these things, the, the pain and the trauma that we've dealt with in our life, without forgiveness, left to themselves, they become places where the devil can get a foothold and destroy our lives from within. And sometimes we don't even realize it. Sometimes we think I've put that down. It could be something that you dealt with when you were a child and you've just suppressed it and you've just pushed it away because it is too hard to handle. It's too hard to deal with. And so you just have suppressed it and pushed it away. And I'll, I don't need to deal with this anymore. This is something I don't want to think about anymore. And we don't even realize how it is affecting every part of our life, how it's affecting the way we respond to people how it's affecting the way we trust one another, how it's affecting the way we love people, how it's affecting our decisions and affecting different things in our lives. And those things left unnoticed, left to themselves, bitterness, hatred, grudges, all of those things can be so deep within our hearts, we don't even know it's there. And the devil can get a foothold in that and begin to destroy our lives from within. Our unforgiveness, it starts to creep into daily actions. It starts creeping into responses, and it becomes a part of our lives, though we think it no longer affects us. Tonight, I want to give you guys four things to remember about forgiveness. Four things to remember about forgiveness. Number one, I'm going to give them to you. Um, quickly right now, and then I'm going to go into them uh, individually. But number one, recognize where the sin has come from. Number two, forgiveness can sometimes require confession. Recognize where the sin has come from, number one. Number two, forgiveness can sometimes require confession. Number three, forgiveness takes time. And number four, nobody deserves forgiveness, but forgiveness is available to all. Number one tonight, recognize where the sin has come from. When we talk about sin, a lot of times what we're thinking about in the, is especially in this topic of forgiveness, when we talk about sin, we think sin is kind of a, um, is really one facet. We think that sin is one facet. It is just what I do that was wrong. So when we think about sin and we think about um, the effects of sin, we often just kind of internalize this is what some, something that, has, that I do wrong or something that somebody else does wrong. But sin in the Old Testament, when, when the Bible is talking about sin in the Old Testament, it's referring to kind of temple language when we get into the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, there is uh, the temple. You guys know of the temple that was built in the Old Testament. And there are all of these things that are made for the temple. There's all of these different items that are made for the temple for um, 
practice and for worship and for uh, living with God and being in his presence and all these different things that were made by different people for the temple in that daily practice and in that weekly practice of worshiping the Lord. And each of those things were not just allowed to be built and then thrown into the temple. There was a holiness kind of sanctification process to make sure those things were holy, to make sure those things were set apart for a specific purpose in the temple. So there was, there was different types of sacrifices and different types of thing that would cleanse those items to get into the temple and to be useful in the temple. And in the same way, we are, are, are um, uh, we, as in the Old Testament of people as they would want to enter into the temple, they would have to go through similar processes like similar sanctification processes to get into the temple. So they had to be sanctified. You couldn't just walk into the temple. You know, in our, in our modern time, it's like come as you are so you can come in flip flops and shorts and your hair like I woke up like this and like, you know, it just looking like a hot mess. You can come in like that or you can come in with a purse and your you know, suit and tie and your brief, you can come in however you'd like to come in. And that is like the blessing that Jesus has given to each and every one of us, that there's not this requirement of what we have to do to get into his presence, that God's cleansing is enough for us, that Christ's blood, his sacrifice for us was enough for us to just boldly come now into his throne room of grace. But that's not how it always was. There was a sanctification process that was needed. And so, that sanctification process made us holy to be able to enter into the temple. But there was things in your life, there was things that you would do that would defile you. There was things that you would do, sin that you would do that would defile you. So there was a number of different things. That's what, what the, why the law was given. The law, there was a bunch of different requirements of keeping your holiness and remaining holy. And, and if you broke one of those things, if you yourself broke it, there was defilement. But that's not where it ended there. It also, defilement comes from something that was done for, to you. If something that was done to you, something that would break the law, there was a defilement that happened to you, you were now unclean because of something done to you. You had no, um, no you know, nothing to do with it. You didn't actually do anything. Something was done to you and that defiled you from getting into the temple. There was also other laws and other things that would happen that if it, was, if it happened around you, if you were even in the general vicinity of this thing, it would defile you. So one of those things like for Samson, it was being around a dead animal. If you are around something that is dead and the carcass is rotting and all those things and you happen to come across it, you didn't mean to, you just stumbled across it. It's not like, whoa, I didn't mean to do that. And it's like, oh, no, don't worry, don't worry, you're, you're fine. No, that defiled you. There was something, something that was done around you. And this is so important to remember in our own forgiveness is to recognize where sin has come from. We're talking about defilement here. We're not talking about just what we do ourselves, but there is a threefold kind of um, uh, process with this where it is defilement comes from sin that is done by you. Defilement comes from sin that is done to you and defilement comes from sin that is done around you. Sin that is done by you, sin that is done to you, and sin that is done around you. It's recognizing where sin has come from because that deep hurt within our hearts is not just because of the things we've done. There's deep hurt within our hearts. There's stuff that, needs to, that God needs to cleanse and heal, and it's stuff that you had nothing to do with but it's still defilement. It's still, in, another, in other words, it's still destructive in your life. Defilement and that destruction still is happening because sin was done to you and you were a victim of it. Or sin was done around you and you were a victim of it. It could be something as simple as you were, uh, a, you were a kid and you were walking into your house and your parents had something on the TV that you weren't supposed, to, weren't supposed to see and now that is something you just walked into something and you've now walked into you know, sin that has been done around you. You had nothing to do with it, but it still affects you. Sin, no matter where it comes from, no matter if I'm doing it or it's being done to me or it's being done around me, it affects me. 
It affects me, it affects you. And so it's recognizing where these things come from because as we're searching our hearts and as we're pouring our hearts out to the Lord and saying, God, search my heart. Am I, where, where, am, where, am I, where am I at with this? And who do I need to forgive? Or where, what do I need to, to uh, you know, where do you need to heal my life? And what areas do you need to heal? You're not just looking for the things you've done. Think about the things that, man, was there something done to me? Was there something done around me? Recognize where the sin has come from. We're talking about defilement here. Number two, forgiveness can sometimes require confession. So when you have figured out those things in your life, when you have seen where it has come from, even if it is something that you had nothing to do with, it was done to you or done around you, I believe that that, and I believe the Bible teaches that that kind of, that, that sin that has been done to you should be confessed to the Lord. And, and listen to me when I say this, because this can get confusing. It's not confessing as if you've done it. You've done nothing wrong. Unless you're the one that did it. Unless you're the one that, if you recognize that, man, this, is, happen, this happened in my life, this is here in my life because this is my fault. This is what I did. But there's so many things that we've been victims of, so many people in this room probably that have been victims of something that has been done to you or around you. But that defilement needs to still come before the Lord. It still needs to be confessed before God because you still need to get it out of your heart. Get it out of your mind and lay it at the altar of God and let God take it. Let God take it away. Let God heal you of that, those things, the things that have been done to you or the things that have been done around you. It still should be confessed to the Lord. And so it's really, God, would you search my heart? Would you search my heart and figure out, Lord, I need you to figure out what are the things, man, I don't know why I don't trust these people. I don't know why I don't trust this person. Why am I struggling with this, Lord? Why am I struggling with this trust? Is there something in my life? Did it begin somewhere? Did that distrust begin somewhere in my life? And maybe it wasn't because you did something, but something was done to you and you think, man, I think that that's where it began. Lord, was this it? God, I just want to confess this to you. I don't know if this is the spot, but God, would you heal me? Would you heal me from that? Would you help me to forgive this person or help me to, to, to forgive the, the, these people or whatever it is because, God, I can see that that has been, been just tearing me up from the inside out and has been affecting me from that day, and I need you to cleanse me. I need you to heal me. And so it's confessing those things before the Lord. But also forgiveness can require your own confession. God, I see where I've gone wrong here. I see where I've done these things and I need to confess this to you. God, would you forgive me? I can see where I've gone wrong here. I can see where I did, you know, did something wrong. And so I need your forgiveness. But also it may require you to confess to those you have wronged. For reconciliation to happen, it requires humility. We're going to talk about this next week, the reconciliation uh, in that Matthew 18 talks about, this restoration of relationships, and that requires humility. That requires your own humility to humble your heart and to say, hey, I want to tell you something. I wronged you. I sinned against you. I did this to you, and I'm sorry. I, I want to confess my sin to you, and I'm sorry. And being able to come to the person in our humility and to confess our sins to one another. Reconciliation, it begins with humility. But it's asking the Lord, God, would you search my heart? Why am I the way that I am? Why am I responding in these ways? You've given me new life, but I feel like I'm, I'm still struggling in these areas. God, would you search my heart and know me and, and pull those, those things out? Number three, forgiveness takes time. It's not automatic some things need to happen first before forgiveness, before God leads you to forgiveness. I want to encourage you with that tonight, that like uh, the, the deeper the pain is, the greater the hurt, is, it requires more time for forgiveness. Some of you have gone through real, real deep pain, real hurt. You've been victims of real things. And I'm not up here saying, well, you better just forgive that person so, and move on because you're ruining your life. Just forgive them. No, it takes time. 
Forgiveness takes time. It takes trust. There's some, some things, sometimes things need to happen in that where God's, God's own, he's healing your heart. He's pulling things out. He's, he's leading you to the person to reconcile with, whatever it is. Uh, but the reality is, is that forgiveness can take time and that's okay. There's no rush in that. There's no rush of, of trying to do something, you know, to try to speed up the process or things like that. God's going to walk you through each and every step of that. Forgiveness can take time. And lastly, number four tonight, nobody deserves forgiveness, but forgiveness is available to all. Philemon, in this, as, as this letter is talking about, he had every right to do what he wanted to Onesimus. He had every right to do it, every right socially, every right in, in the justice system, the people around him, the Christians around him would not probably even bat an eye because this was just the practice of life. But Paul was pleading for full restoration and he was offering to pay for all that was indebted to him. And you may have every right to receive what is due to you. You may have every right to receive what is due to you, but God may want you to show his forgiveness instead. Because the reality of it is that the forgiveness that we have received from God was not anything that we deserved on our own. And so the forgiveness that God is asking us to give to other people is not your own forgiveness. He's asking you to give his forgiveness. He is asking you to pour out his love to the people around you. So he's not saying you better just try to muster it up on your own and try to just stir up that forgiveness on your, you got to learn, you got to go to these different like, you know, classes to learn how to build up your forgiveness. There's a different workout that you can do at the gym that just builds up that muscle of forgiveness. So then you can go out and just start forgiving people. No, that forgiveness comes from one place and one place only. It comes from the same place we received it comes from the same person that we received it and we didn't deserve it ourselves. And God freely, unconditionally, without, there was nothing that we did to earn it and God still gave it to us anyways. And he's calling his people. He says, go out into the world, into this justice system that is available to everybody to be able to sue somebody, to be able to get what you deserve. Get what's due to you. And he says, I want you to go out and show my forgiveness to this world. I want you to go out and to show my love, my kindness, and my forgiveness to the people around you. There's this, uh, do you guys remember um, uh, the, um, the Cinderella movie, the, like the live adaptation of Cinderella that just came out like a few years ago? Um, there's a part in it. My wife loves the movie. And... Uh, um, there is a part in it where everybody knows the story of Cinderella. It's an old story, and, and uh, she just, you know, she's uh, the, the slave of the home, and her, steps, her evil stepsisters and her stepmom, and, and she, uh, you know, she wishes upon a star, and the, the fairy godmother comes down, and she gets to be in a pumpkin and go to the ball and, and dance with the prince and lose a glass slipper. And I don't know if the, why, if the glass slipper fit so perfect, why it fell off in the first place, but it did. <laughs> Slips off, she goes and, and uh, runs back, and then the prince is trying to find her, and she finds her and all this kind of stuff. Well, this is a live adaptation. They all lived happily ever after. He finds her, they get married, they love each other, and uh, they run off into the sunset. There's a live ad adaptation of it. And... Um, and it, be, it makes it become a little bit more real, seeing real people walk through this. And, uh, and in this movie, I mean, they really, really push like the evil stepsisters and the evil stepmom. And they do some cruel things to her and they say some really cruel things to her. And they added something at the end of this story, at the end of this movie. Um, you know, she, they lock her up in, in the top of the tower and the prince, you know, he's trying to, he, he's like, do you have any other, you know, ladies here? And, and uh, she gets out of it. He puts the, the shoe on her, it fits, and uh, she comes down, and she's walking down the steps, and the stepmom is there, the stepsisters are there, and they've lost. They've lost, right? And this is the moment for her to just stick it to the man and say something, or to say to the prince, like, throw them in prison, or they've wronged me, and get them out of here, or, you know, off with their head, or something like that. They had, she had the full moment to do this, and as she's walking down the stairs, she looks at her stepmom in the eyes, and she just says, 
I forgive you. And yeah, right? It's like, oof. It, I'm like watching this and I got like teary-eyed watching this Cinderella movie again. I'm like, what is going on? And it's it just like anything she could have said in this moment, anything she, she could have done, and she just looks at her and says, I forgive you. And it was like a dagger piercing the heart, you know, like she didn't deserve any of it. And yet she extended this forgiveness to her stepmom. There's a, a, a real actual story of this kind of forgiveness I want to share with you guys as we close tonight, but there's this real story. You guys may uh, know this lady named Corey Temboom. And, uh, you know, again, forgiveness, it doesn't come from you. It's the work of God in and through you. And so if you're struggling, like, I don't know if I can forgive this person. I don't know if I can really extend that kind of love and forgiveness. Remember where it, the source of it and where it comes from. Corey Temboom is um, a lady that, that walked through. Um, she's a Jewish lady, so she was in the Holocaust. And um, she was in a concentration camp. And uh, the story goes is she's in this concentration camp. She watched her dad and her and her sister get murdered right in front of her. And it was burned so much in her, in, in her brain that, I mean, it was like this post-traumatic, um, you know, uh, this PTSD that she was dealing with where she had dreams of it. She remembered this person that did it. And uh, the war is won. She's older now. She's preaching at different churches and she's sharing her testimony at different churches and she's sharing at this one church and she looks out and she sees the German guy that killed her dad and killed her sister in the congregation. And all, you know, she, I couldn't even imagine the pain that you're going through and just like, what do I do right now? She gets done with her story and this man approaches her and she is like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say, what to do. He's coming before her and he's like, I just need forgiveness. I need God's love. And he's just broken before her. And this is the end of the story. You can Google it. It's an amazing story. But I just want to read to you guys the end of it from, from Corey Ten Boom. She writes, as she's looking at this man, she writes, I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand and I could not. I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity, and so again I breathed the silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder along my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives, along with the command, the love itself. The forgiveness is not going to come from you. It's going to come from the Lord. So as you're walking through forgiveness, as you're learning about it, you're clinging to his forgiveness while you're doing it. You're looking to his love. You're looking to his grace and his mercy to do it because we cannot give it on our own. There's, I'm telling you, for me, there's only so much forgiveness I have in my own heart. And I'm sure every one of us could say the same thing. There's so, only so much I can give to go, but, but I know what you've done to me. I know what you did to me. And to, but to receive the forgiveness of God and to pour that out, man, there is so much freedom, the weight that is lifted off of people's shoulders as they receive God's forgiveness through each and every one of us. Um, I do want to say tonight, too, I didn't, I didn't have time to go through this. If you have been a victim of some type of trauma or abuse, the process of forgiveness is a bit different that I would love to share more about with you after the service. So if you, um, if you are struggling with that, um, you know, I would love to be able to walk you through something uh, like that and what that process looks like because it is a bit different for those who have been uh, real victims of some type of trauma or abuse. So you can see me after the service if, uh, if you're interested. But next week, we're going to talk about um, reconciliation because uh, uh, Paul is not only encouraging Philemon um, to forgive Onesimus, but there is a reconciliation that he's asking for him. There's a full restoration that he's asking of him that I want to get into next week as we study that alongside Matthew 18. Um,